live from San Francisco, California. It's The Cube at VMworld 2014, brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hi, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org, SiliconANGLE TV's live continuous coverage from VMworld 2014 here in San Francisco. Our fifth year at the show, so much going on, cloud, software-defined data center, converged infrastructure. I'm um, going to dig into a second a segment now with uh, CUBE alumni, Howie Zhu, uh, who's a senior director of networking, uh, a senior director of engineering with cloud networking and services with Cisco. Howie, thanks very much for coming back on theCUBE. Thank you for inviting me here. So, Howie, uh, you've been at many of these shows in the past. You, you, you're a, a VMware alumni, um, work for in some of the startup world, and uh, now with Cisco, who uh, is, is a large partner of VMware, and uh, some places where there's disagreement as to where the future of things go. Um, what, what's your take on the show so far? Interesting you asked me this question. Uh, this is my 11th VMworld. <laughs> um, I was at VMware for almost a decade. I'll tell you a story first. Okay. Uh, back in 2007, um, and uh, Diane Green, of course, at the time CEO of VMware, um, did a, a keynote speech. And I guess who, still remember who was the other person who did a keynote together with her? It was John Chambers? It was John Chambers. Yes. Since I was running the networking team at VMware, everyone was asking me one question. Why John Chambers as the CEO of a networking company here at a server virtualization conference? Seven years later, net last year, VMware 2013, VMware announced the uh, NSX and I just joined Cisco. Everyone asked me, from VMware asked me this question, or outside of VMware asked me this question. Why Cisco's logo is not on it? Now one year later, people ask me more interesting question. You guess what, what it is. But I think you know, that's sort of the story aside. I think if you look at the networking overall in the last five, seven years, it's a huge shift, right? Um, I think the awareness of the problem definitely surfaced dramatically. Now in terms of you know, how people are really adopting the technology, is that doing things significantly differently? I think you know, it's still lagging behind. If you look at a server, memory virtualization, it's definitely out there, right? Storage virtualization, it's almost there. Networking virtualization, or you know, link between virtual and the physical, it's still, you know, there is a quite a bit difference. Distance yeah. away. So, so, so Howie, you know, help us unpack that a little bit. So, you know, VMware has always had some networking. I mean, you ran the networking group in, in, inside of VMware, the virtual networking switch, the distributed switch, um, put out an API so that Cisco could create the Nexus 1000. Uh, then, of course, the shot heard around the world, uh, you know, two years ago, put this whole SDN discussion on the map with the NICERA acquisition, um, and, and really it, it, it spawned a whole, uh, you know, it, it kind of a revolution in the industry. Uh, we'll have Martine on, in on Wednesday. Uh, to, to give the update from the yes. VMware side. Um, you know, how far have we come and you know, how, how far do we need to go for kind of this discussion of the physical versus the virtual uh, networking? I think there is a long distance away. I mean, if you look at it from the VMware perspective, okay, 70% of the workloads are virtualized. So if I have a, a networking virtualization solution for that 70% of workload, I'm you know, almost there, right, 70% there. But if you look at it from a networking admin's perspective, I have you know, 10 ports, and one of the ports connecting to a vSphere, which runs 20 VMs. And uh, so 20 out of the 29 uh, workloads, are, you know, that's 70% are virtualized. But from a networking perspective, that's one port out of the 10 ports that are vir you know, connecting to a vSphere environment. So even if I can go all the way adopting VMware NSX uh, technology, let's say for a second, I cannot fire any network admins. That's the reality today. So I don't save any OPEX by adopting NSX. Of course, NSX is not free of charge, so I'm not saving any CapEx. So what, what is the real saving here? Now, not to say future, it cannot get there, but that's the, you know, today's uh, state of the art. Okay, so you're saying you're looking to fire network engineers then? Well, you, it's not about firing networking engineer. It's the, the entire industry movement, the IT industry movement, is all, always about the money shift. Where's the money shift of one, from one place to another place? All I'm saying is the money shift has not happened yet. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. One of the biggest discussions is when I did server virtualization, I could have an immediate capex savings because I could uh, consolidate there. And uh, you know, the story on whatever the networking SDN network virtualization is not as clear cut from a capex standpoint. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So, you know, VMware has, uh, you know, talked a lot about open source uh, in their keynote this morning. Pat Gelsinger got up, talked about open compute, talked about open stack, talked about Docker. Um, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time over the last year talking with Cisco about some of the open sources initiatives. You have things like OpFlex, uh, involved in open networking. Yes. Um, you know, what, what, what's your take on, you know, how much is open source influencing networking? What's, what's, what's your position on, on kind of the networking and open source? Yeah, you're opening a <laughs> can of worms here. Um, open. I mean, people wa want to open because they don't like vendor locking. That's the sort of rationale behind it. People are so enthusiastic about you know, going for the open solution. Yet at the same time, open doesn't mean mature maturity, right? Doesn't imply maturity there. You know, VMware announced the OpenStack um, distro this morning. It's interesting to me that this is probably, I don't know, 17th or 20th OpenStack distribution on the planet. Uh, yet when I count the number of real, solid, um, OpenStack install base, it's actually, it's possible less than 20. I don't know, you know, there may be more in, uh, distro, distros than the number of, you know, really large uh, install base out there. This means that OpenStack is still in its, you know, early stage. So in the meanwhile, I think it makes perfect sense for VMware sort of to grab the market, to sort of, you know, come in, I have OpenStack, you know, I manage VMware environment really well. So I think that's a very good move. Docker is a very another interesting thing. There are so many bloggers talking about blog, uh, you know, Docker's whether that's you know uh, disrupting VMware technology. My personal take is uh, VMware has to say what they say at a marketing wise, right? You know, their marketing language seems to be very clear. Better together. Now, the way I read them better together is if you ask a Microsoft guy 10 years ago, when it comes to Windows versus a VM, they probably would have say better together too. But their better together is a very different from VMware's view of better together 10 years ago. I think today VMware had this, you know, has the same sort of the issue where fundamentally VMware's number one um, object is a virtual machine. Container is just a sort of a together partner at a marketing wise. So it will, it will be interesting to see. I personally, it, I feel like Docker can disrupt the virtualization space tremendously. Yeah, and, and Howie, I'm in agreement. I attended DockerCon, it was a fascinating show. Um, I, I didn't hear Yahoo or Google or Facebook talking about you know, VMware uh, when, when they were using the containers. I mean, you, you know, it's a very different um, you know, way to look at your applications. Of course, they're doing applications that span you know, well beyond a single server many times, hundreds of thousands of servers, as opposed to a traditional VM is putting you know, an operating system with a, an application inside of it. So very different from, from a networking standpoint, um, you know, how does kind of the containerization and Docker uh, impact networking? I mean, we, we spent years talking about how virtualization changed us from north, south to east, west. Uh, how, how do things like Docker impact the network? I think the, in terms of the networking primitives, um, Docker has a lot of the, you know, equivalent of the Linux bridge, OVS in it already. So that's not a problem. The problem is really the, the provision, the lifecycle management. I think in terms of the Docker, you know, both of us are in violent agreement that it has the, you know, um, disruptive um, potential because it's, you know, potentially 10x more efficient, 10x, you know, more um, faster. However, at the same time, the lifecycle management, the provisioning, you know, all the sort of the uh, things you need to do on the day-to-day -day thing doesn't quite exist. It applies to CPU memory management, it applies to storage management, it applies to uh, networking management. So I would say that the core technology is you know right there, um, but you know there is, uh, but that's only 10% of the um, the product. 90% of the product is to deal with the boring, you know, the day-to-day -day management. That thing is still you know someone need to take that you know and then take that challenge and then do it. Okay, so. I wonder if we can, you know, discuss a little bit cloud, kind of the public versus, you know, a private hybrid cloud discussion. Um, you know, how does how does your role kind of fit into uh, the, the whole cloud conversation? Well, cloud, I think VMware also understands this issue, and the Cisco sees the same issue in that enterprise customers wanted a public cloud. They wanted to move things into some public cloud. At the same time, that's CIO view. But if you look at the CSO view, the security guy's view, no, I don't have enough security, I don't have enough compliance, I don't have enough visibility. I want to slow down the move. That's the really the struggle between CIO and the CSO today. And then that problem is not solved today. VMware wanted to solve this problem one way, and Cisco has you know, um, um, slightly different approach. 
Um, but that problem is yet to be solved. So that's sort of the one angle of the issue. The other angle of the issue is, you know, we, we were discussing the, the Docker thing, um, Docker and the container thing. Docker and the container is built, in, you know, in some ways, is very much suitable for this uh, inter-cloud kind of things. Because, you know, at from Cisco's perspective, we wanted to not just uh, treat the VM movement migration between uh, on-prem versus off-prem, um, treating VM as the first class citizen, but also the container and the con uh, Docker kind of the ob objects as the, as the object that we wanted to migrate. Okay, so yeah, I mean, w one of the, the questions you talk about kind of that inner cloud world, and we believe that you know there there will be you know quite a few clouds out there. It's not one, and of course, VMware looks at everything needs to be a VM, you know, a VMware VM. Um, however, the NSX group, uh, from a networking standpoint, they do support you know more than just you know VMware. Um, you yeah. know, what, what, what's what's Cisco's position on this? You know, where where do you see the cloud world? I know you've got your inter cloud solution, very, high, very much tightly partnered with service providers. Uh, you know, how do you see this evolving? Yeah, I, I think this is where the future battle is. You know, I actually run the engineering team of the Intercloud Fabric within Cisco, and uh, the way I look at it is, um, again, it's a more about life cycle management. It's more, it's, it's, you know, the core technology, Cisco has that technology. Cisco need to uh, move up the stack uh, to make sure that people can just, uh, not just have the layer two, layer three connectivity, but also, you know, entire life cycle management. And uh, for NSX or VMware or another technology company, that's where I think that where a lot of the gap is today. Okay. Essentially oh. meaning that the technology cannot be a technology, it needs to be a turnkey solution that I can use right away. Yeah, you know, really good point. So, you know, one thing when just looking at the overall market, SDN has been much, very much a discussion of various tools. If I look at NFV, network function virtualization, feels like they have end-to-end -end solutions a little bit easier and therefore they've been going to market a little bit faster out there. Uh, you know, what's your take on that? You know, how, how do we get SDN really moving forward or, you know, is, is NFV still going to lead for a while? Yeah, I think SDN fundamentally is a component of a, a, a solution. That's why, um, you know, it's it's sort of the, the wavelength is a little bit different. Yeah, and if, you get both Cisco and VMware don't really say we're SDN. You've got application centric Well, no one on the planet says SDN the same way anyways, yes. that, but that's a different story. But NFV is sort of, there is a very solid, uh, concrete um, definition. Okay, here's my networking functions before, and then now it's after. So it's sort of leveraging the virtualization platform, leveraging that maybe SDN layer underneath that. Here is a very s solid solution, you know, before and after. SDN, you know, what is before, what is after? You know, it's a little bit, you know, more fluffy than the NFV side. Absolutely, so. Uh, Just like we discussed, you know, what is the OPEX saving? What is the CAPEX saving? Can you define that? Is there metrics to define that? With NFV, it's a lot easier to define. With SDN, you know, it's less, 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 you know, uh, easy to do that. Yeah, and, and one of the one of the things I look at, Howie, is you know, if you're you know, really large web scale company, or if you're a service provider, it's much easier to be able to build out that new data center or, or adopt these technologies. How? How far down, you know, is the, you know, do the mid-range companies need to even worry about this all SDN discussion, um, or is, is, and if do you reach a certain point, do you just say I'm going to go to some hosted or service services out there um, because you know I don't really need to need to go through that transition. I mean, heck, just the transition from one gig to ten gig has taken us over a yeah, dozen yes, years yes, since yes, the standard. Yes. So you know, wh where is that demarcation line, and who needs to pay attention to this? Uh, really? That's a that's a very interesting question. You know, Pat Geltinger mentioned in the keynote speech this morning that, um, you know, the one example uh, in the keynote speech was this Golden Gate Bridge. I look at a virtualization as a bridging technology between the old guard IT sort of technology versus the new guard stuff. But that's a transitional technology, that's a bridging technology. But that doesn't mean it's the, the, you know, the new territory technologies. To answer your question sort of more specifically, I think the, um, I look at uh, um, the, Transitional technology has fundamental limitation. You still have to deal with a virtual machine as the first class citizen. The scale limitation, you know, it's it's still there. For the web guys, web scale guys, Google or the sort of the Google offering service for the SMB, they don't need to think about all of this. So in some ways you ask me a question, you know, Cisco versus sort of the VMware, whether that's perceived or that's just the analysts like to make this up. The real thing is 
um, both VMware and Cisco has a challenge to deal with, which is the uh, public cloud is where the future you know, might be and the workloads are moving there and how to be relevant in that, uh, in that new era. I think it's a challenge for both Cisco and the VMware. Potentially it takes both companies to work together um, see, you know, to come have a real relevant solution so that um, this hybrid cloud thing is, is there. Or you know, um, um, some other startups or you know, uh, Cisco can re reinvent itself and uh, there are all sorts of possibilities. Yeah, so, so you know, Howie, you know, you, you've, you've been on both sides of the table between the VMware and the Cisco piece. We, we had Sony on last year right after the keynote and she talked about you know, the tight partnerships, the many things that Cisco and VMware are doing together and where the vision differs. You know, the last year, you know, what have you seen? You know, where, where, where are the you know, tight engagements and where are the areas where, uh, you know, just to g give us a final word on that. So, I cannot speak for VMware, but, but the way I look at it from outside of these days is, you know, it's really how to treat the physical network from VMware's perspective, physical network is not that important, it's commodity. Um, but if you read the NSX uh, manual, it says I need existing network, but what's the definition of existing network? Its definition is this high sc highly scalable, leaf spine, you know, low, uh, low latency, but that network doesn't quite exist for majority of the enterprise customers. So it's sort of like uh, um, Cisco's take is I give you a solution that deals with both physical and the virtual. In my personal sort of opinion, that makes sense because people are, there are two transition here. One is dealing with this networking virtualization. The other thing is this three here networking to this leaf spine architecture. Cisco is leveraging both mo um, uh, motion. One is I'm, I'm, I'm migrating from the three-tier network to the leaf spine, and then and an ACI gives you that. And at the same time, you want SDM functionality, I give you that. From VMware's perspective, it seems like you know, the physical network transition, it's all, you, know, I, you can take it for granted, I don't need to do anything. But I think people need to do a lot of work on the physical side in order to, for, for the entire solution, holistic solution to make sense. All right, well Howie, really appreciate you coming, helping us unpack all the discussions going on in the, the networking space, physical and virtual, uh, and how we're trying to solve those problems to make it easier for customers to be able to you know, take advantage of the, their infrastructure to deliver on the applications of the future. Uh, we'll be right back with lots more coverage from VMworld after this quick break. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, your next guy's here.